is called to order. Mr. Trowman, has anyone signed up for public comment? All right. Good morning, Ms. Miller. Good morning, sir. I understand we have two cases to reconsider under agenda item three. Yes, sir, that's correct. Um, Commission Appeals is requesting permission to resubmit case number 2720175. This case appeared on docket 14, voted on April 6, 2021, and no decision has been mailed. After the vote, it was determined that clarification of the vote is needed. Therefore, Commission Appeals requests to resubmit the case so that the vote may be clarified. Uh, Commissioner Alvarez? I agree with staff's recommendation. Commissioner agree with staff's recommendation. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the second case, uh, Commission Appeals is requesting to mail a letter of continuing jurisdiction in case number 2770355. Five. This case was voted on docket 21 on May 25th, 2021. The majority voted to deny the claimant's motion for rehearing, Labor Commissioner dissenting, and the decision was mailed that same day. The 14th day from the mailing date is June 8, 2021. After the decision was mailed, it was determined that TWC is in possession of relevant evidence that has not yet been considered in the appeal. Therefore, Commission Appeals requests to mail a letter of continuing jurisdiction so that appropriate action may be taken with regard to this evidence. Commissioner Alvarez? I agree with staff's recommendation. Commissioner Dennis? I agree. Mr. Shannon? Agreed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move to tax liability cases. Under agenda item four, I think we have one tax case on docket 22 and two cases on docket 23. That is correct, sir. On docket 22, the case is TD-21-007-0421. Commissioner Dimerson. I agree with the staff recommendation that the job skills trainers are in employment and that the employer is subject to administrative penalties for misclassification of workers on a public contract. I'm concerned that, our, that the contractor in this case was working so closely with our agency on workforce services since 2019 yet apparently did not find out well into the contract period that our tax department would have a problem with the classification of their workers. I do not believe that the company intentionally violated the law on worker classification. It may be appropriate for our agency to review the extent to which our workforce partners are proactively helped to discover and resolve potential employment law compliance issues before a situation gets to the point where penalties must be imposed. I agree with staff's recommendation. Agree with staff recommendation. Thank you. On docket 23, the first case is TD-21-005-0321. Commissioner Dimerson. I agree with staff recommendation. Commissioner Alvarez. I agree with staff's recommendation. And Mr. Shannon. I agree with staff recommendation. The second case is TD-21-006-0421. Commissioner Dimerson. I agree with staff recommendation. Commissioner Alvarez. I agree with staff's recommendation. And Mr. Chairman. I agree with staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. We have no fair housing cases on Mr. agenda Chairman, item five. Let me, let me ask you a question. Terry, th those numbers, the appeal numbers, again. Yes, sir. I wanna, just going to make sure we're in sync. And so the first number. On which docket? Uh, 23. 23. The first number was TD-21-005-0321. Okay. And the second? And the second case was uh, TD-21-006-0421. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Something different here, but that, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Agenda item five. No fair housing cases on agenda item five. Correct, sir. Yeah. Uh, no wage claim cases on docket 22 or 23 pulled for additional discussion. That's correct. None pulled for additional discussion, but you should have received the wage claim short form dissent list for docket 22 and 23. I'll move to accept staff recommendations on remaining wage claim cases on docket 22 and docket 23. I second the motion except for those cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected on the wage claim short form dissent list for docket 22 and 23. And I concur with the chairman's motion except for the cases on which I'm dissenting uh, as reflected in the wage claim short form dissent list for docket 22 and 23. Motion passes with the exception of noted. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to agenda item seven, consideration of unemployment insurance cases on docket 22. Case 2606201, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant was signed up to receive paper correspondence. The claimant testified he did not receive the May 28, 2020 determination and was unaware of the adverse determination until he saw it online. It is far more likely the determination was simply lost in the mail than the claimant's roommate received the document and kept it from the claimant. 
the claimant's appeal should be deemed timely and the case resubmitted for merits. Reverse the AT timely claimant appeal, uh, resubmit for merits. Uh, the AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant did not allege non-receipt of the determination in his appeal, and his testimony suggests that his roommate may have neglected to give the determination to the claimant. The determination was mailed to the claimant's correct address of record, and it was not returned as undeliverable. Under these facts, the claimant's appeal was late, and we do not have jurisdiction to consider the underlying merits of this case. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision, untimely claimant appeal, misconduct, no chargeback. Reverse the AT, timely claimant appeal, resubmit. Thank you. We will resubmit this case. Case 2651533, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant is receiving a payment that is a fraction of his former wage and which is less than his weekly benefit amount. The claimant should not be disqualified for payments that are less than the claimant's weekly benefit amount. Reverse the AT, no severance disqualification. The <coughs> AT decision should be reversed. Since the claimant received only one-third of his normal pay, I agree that the payment did not constitute disqualifying severance. However, a memo should be sent to UIA and OS to include these earnings as wages on the claimant's claim certification. We should reverse the AT decision, no severance disqualification, memo to UIA and OS to correct earnings. Reverse the AT, no severance disqualification, memo to investigate possible unreported earnings. Thank you. We have a unanimous decision, and those memo issues will be submitted to UIA and OS. Case 2663746, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. As the appeal involves a validity of claim issue, the claimant's appeal to the original determination should be deemed timely. Regarding the backdating issue, the claimant has consistently provided that, the first co that he first contacted the agency to file a claim on June 7, 2020, but was unable to get through to a representative. As such, his claim should be backdated to June 7, 2020. Reverse the AT deem appeal timely, backdating granted to June 7, 2020. Uh, the AT decision should be reversed. I agree that the claimant's appeal should be deemed timely. As to the validity of claim issue, I agree that the claimant's request to backdate his claim should be granted. Accordingly, we should reverse the AT decision, timely claimant appeal, grant request to backdate. Reverse the AT, timely claimant appeal, backdate the IC to June 7, 2020. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Demerson, do you agree with the June 7, 2020 date? Thank you. We have a unanimous decision. Case 2663755, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The claimant accepted a voluntary leave of absence. Even though some flights were available, she was not going to be able to do those flights due to the lack of seniority. Other cases with this employer have established that even with 8,000 flight attendants accepting leave packages, the employer remained overstaffed by 5,000 flight attendants. There were no guaranteed hours for the claimant other than those in the leave of absence package. The claimant had good cause to accept the voluntary leave package. Reverse AT, no voluntary leaving, no overpayment. The AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant elected to accept the employer's early out package <coughs> rather than continue working. Since participation in the program was not mandatory and since further work was available to the claimant, she quit without work connected good cause. We should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, overpayment of $5,044. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, overpayment, memo to investigate possible unreported earnings. Short form dissent. I have your short form dissent, and we will send that memo, Mr. Chairman. Case 269736, Commissioner Demerson. The commission should grant a rehearing in this case. <clears throat> in its appeal to the commission, the employer states that it filed an earlier appeal on September 18, 2020, which fell inside the appeal deadline. Given the speci specificity of the employer's contention that it filed a timely appeal, we should conduct a rehearing to allow the employer to submit evidence of its earlier appeal. The decision should be affirmed. The wage verification notice was provided to the employer electronically as the employer requested. The employer viewed the notice the day he posted to the employer's account. There are no good cause exceptions to the timeliness rules. The employer's appeal at the AT was made after 14-day deadline and was therefore late. Affirm the AT, no timely employer appeal, bill reimbursement employer. 
three here. Thank you. We will review the case. Case 2715087, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The claimant in this case has a pre existing health condition and is over 65. Both made her at risk of severe illness if she contracted COVID. No evidence has been presented that continuing to work was available to the claimant when she accepted the voluntary early, out, early payout package. It is common knowledge that the airline industry suffered severe losses due to the pandemic. Reverse AAT, no voluntary leaving, no chargeback disaster. The AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant accepted the, the employer's retirement package rather than continue working. <clears throat> Participation was voluntary and further work was available. As such, the claimant quit without work connected good cause. Furthermore, I would not agree to an MDI because the claimant did not resign due to medical reasons. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2727824, two, Commissioner Demerson. The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant accumulated the requisite amount of attendance points to be terminated under the employer's policy. The claimant stated that prior to the final incidents, she was aware her job was in jeopardy and that she could be terminated. Nonetheless, the claimant continued to incur attendance points. As such, work connected misconduct was established. <clears throat> we should therefore affirm the AT decision, misconduct, no chargeback. In the alternative, if my fellow commissioners are not satisfied that misconduct took place, I would agree to rehear the case for further development <clears throat> of the record regarding the claimant's final absence. The AT decision is not supportable. The claimant was discharged for attendance infractions, supposedly in excess of what was allowed under the employer's policy. The employer failed to provide any evidence about the final attendance infraction that resulted in the, accumul the accumulation of more points than were allowed under the policy. Since the employer failed to establish that the claimant's attendance actually violated the policy, the employer also did not establish that the claimant was discharged for misconduct connected with the work. Reverse AT, no misconduct, chargeback. <coughs> Affirm the AT, misconduct, no chargeback. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2750968, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant was called into a meeting in which her ability to perform the job was questioned due to her age. The employer has not provided any evidence to establish the claimant was unable to do the job and have not noted and have not noted a single incident caused by the claimant's capabilities. Although the employer alleges that the claimant quit, they also state that they offered her alternative positions performing kitchen or housekeeping tasks. The employer has not denied the claimant was questioned about her age. The claimant had good cause to quit when she was questioned about her age. Despite no incidents and effectively demoted from her certified nursing assistant position to a kitchen or housekeeping position. Reverse AT, no voluntary leaving, chargeback. The AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant's evidence is outweighed by the employer's firsthand testimony and written statements which established that the claimant resigned. During a conversation with the employer, the claimant admitted that she could not safely perform one of her job duties. The employer tried to work with the claimant and offer her other positions, but she resigned instead. The claimant quit before affording the employer an adequate opportunity to address the matter. In addition, I would not agree to an MDI because the doctor did not advise the claimant to resign. The claimant quit without work connected good cause, and we should affirm the AT decision. Voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2778226, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision is not supportable. The claimant's direct supervisor admitted that the final event leading to the claimant's dismissal was a business slowdown at the time. The HR manager acknowledged that the employer's business slowdown was part of a consideration in the decision to discharge the claimant. The HR manager also described the decision to discharge the claimant as being made after the employer, for apparently no reason, pulled the claimant's personal file and viewed the infractions collectively. It is clear that the employer's decision to discharge the claimant was fundamentally driven by their business slowdown, regardless of his supposed acts of misconduct. The claimant was involuntarily separated at the employer's convenience and not as a result of any misconduct. Reverse AT, no misconduct, chargeback. 
The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant was spotted sleeping at her desk by a supervisor. Given the evidence in this case, it is not unreasonable to conclude that the, this took place at a time that the claimant was expected to be working. As such, and in line with commission precedent, the claimant's actions constituted work-connected misconduct. We should therefore affirm the AT decision, misconduct, no chargeback. Affirm the AT, misconduct, no chargeback. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2783411, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant was discharged for a relationship with a third party the employer deemed to be a violation of their policies. The claimant's relationship was legal and the employer has not provided any policy which would provide notice to the claimant that such a relationship was not allowed. The employer has not established the claimant violating any specific policy. Reverse AT, no misconduct, bill reimbursed the employer. Uh, the appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant was discharged for violating the employer's personal conduct policy. Per the claimant's AT appeal, he admitted to his actions. While the claimant contends in his appeal that his actions took place outside working hours, they nonetheless pervaded the workplace since they were disrespectful to another employee and created a division within the department per the employer's testimony. As such, misconduct connected with the work was established. <clears throat> we should therefore affirm the AT decision, misconduct, reimburse an employer, not bill. Affirm the AT, misconduct, uh, reimburse an employer, not bill. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2784406, <laughs> Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed, no misconduct. The claimant was in a close personal contact with the family members who tested positive for COVID-19. He was told by a medical professional that he should be quarantined. The claimant informed the employer of the situation, but after missing one day of work and running out of leave, the employer would not allow the claimant to miss any more work. The claimant's decision to follow medical advice and not report to work to protect his coworkers was reasonable. Under the circumstances, the claimant's absences were not misconduct. Reverse EAT, no misconduct. The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. <clears throat> the claimant failed to return to work when requested to do so. As such, the claimant's failure to follow instructions constitutes work-connected misconduct. We should therefore affirm the AT decision misconduct. Affirm the AT misconduct. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2786408, Commissioner Demerson. We should reverse the appeal tribunal decision. The claimant was discharged for using profanity within earshot of staff and residents in violation of the employer's policy. In addition to the employer's firsthand testimony, the employer has provided written statements from four witnesses that established that the claimant was yelling and cursing in the facility while in the presence of coworkers and residents. Because this e evidence easily <coughs> overcomes the claimant's denial and establishes that the claimant mismanaged her position of employment, we should reverse the AT decision. Misconduct, no chargeback, adequate employer response. In the alternative, we could grant a rehearing for testimony from the employer's first-hand witness who provided written statements about the final incident. The AT decision is, should be affirmed. The claimant was discharged because the employer accused her of using profanity in the presence of residents. The claimant denied the accusations and provided a witness who supported her testimony. The AT concluded that the claimant's evidence outweighed that from the employer. The AT was in the best position to assess the credibility of the evidence provided in the hearing. The conclusion that the claimant's actions did not constitute misconduct should be affirmed. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, charge back. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, charge back. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner <coughs> Demerson. Case 2787092, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be modified. The claimant did not resign. The employer decided that the claimant was quitting because she could not answer his questions, but she simply did not know the answer to what the former employee was thinking. In addition to saying that the claimant was quitting by not answering his questions, the CEO explicitly stated that it was time for them to part ways and he was trying to come up with an exit agreement. The claimant was discharged. The claimant was not insubordinate. She simply did not know a formal employee's thought process. The evidence is insufficient to establish misconduct connected with the work. Modify the AT, no misconduct, chargeback, void adequate response. <clears throat> the appeal tribunal decision should be modified. 
the parties are in dispute as to who initiated the job separation in this case, while file documents show the employer stating that it would be best to part ways, it was later clearly communicated to the claimant that the employer <coughs> was not firing her yet. Instead, there is sufficient amount of evidence to show that the claimant quit after her job duties changed. Since the claimant quit, she has the burden to establish good cause connected with the work for resigning. The claimant did not do so. Accordingly, we should modify the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no charge back, adequate employer response. Modify the AT, no misconduct, charge back, void, adequate response. Short form dissent. Yes, sir. Commissioner Jamison. Case 2788385, Commissioner Demerson. We should grant a rehearing in this case. The appeal tribunal dis provided incorrect information to the employer about who could be designated as the employer's primary representative. PwC records indicate that the hearing officer and the employer spent almost 20 minutes trying to resolve the issue, but that it was not settled until after testimony had been tendered by the employer. Because the AT erred in its instructions, created confusion about the duties of the employer's primary representative, and denied the employer its chosen representative for a substantial portion of the hearing, <coughs> we should rehear it to cure any potential due process defects. The AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant was never warned about his conduct before the employer decided to discharge him. Additionally, while the employer contended that the claimant closed the store early in violation of policy, it was not clear that the claimant's actions constituted closing the store. A reprimand or warning was in order since the employer's policy was ambiguous as whether it applied the, to the claimant's conduct. Finally, other employees who worked for the employer had uh, engaged in the same actions as the claimant without similar consequences. The claimant's actions did not rise to the level of misconduct. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, chargeback. We hear. We will rehear the case. <coughs> case 2795262, Commissioner Demerson. We should modify the appeal tribunal decision. Because the job separation occurred when the claimant needed to quarantine after being exposed to COVID-19, he should be qualified for the receipt of benefits and the employer's account should be protected from charge. We should modify the AT decision, no misconduct, no chargeback, separation caused by disaster. Ms. Miller, I would agree with Commissioner Demerson. Agree. Thank you. We have a unanimous decision. Case 2796202, Commissioner Alvarez. As is, the record in this case is insufficient to support the AT decision. There was no evidence provided regarding the facts of the final attendance incident. We do not know, based on the testimony in the AT hearing, how many attendance points the claimant had or whether she had been made aware of the attendance policy. Given the failure to develop these fundamental facts of an attendance separation, the case should be reheard to adequately develop the record. Rehear. We should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. The claimant was discharged after exceeding the allowable points under the employer's attendance policy. Accordingly, the AT decision is fully supportable and we should affirm. Misconduct, no chargeback. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, chargeback. We have not yet achieved a majority vote. I would agree with the chairman. Yes, sir, thank you. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Damison. And that was the last case uh, pulled for discussion on docket 22. You should have received the UI short form dissent list for docket 22. I move we accept staff recommendations on the remaining UI cases on docket 22. I second the motion except for those cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected on the UI sh short form dissent list for docket 22. I concur with the chairman's motion except for the cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected in the UI short form dissent list for docket 22. Motion passes with the exceptions noted. Case 2568652, Commissioner Alvarez. Although the good cause issue was not particularly well developed, I will not contest that the good cause ruling as there is ample evidence from its first hearing to establish the decision was not supportable. As testified to the employer, the claimant provided the employer with over three months of notice of her intent to resign effective July 1st, 2020. On April 9th, 2020, while the claimant was quarantined, the employer decided to discharge her purportedly so they could hire and train a replacement at a time that was convenient for them. 
the employer did not hire a replacement because the business was slow. The employer has not provided any other reasons for discharging the claimant and has not provided any evidence of misconduct. Under longstanding commission precedent, when one party provides notice in excess of two weeks and such a notice is accepted before the intended effective date, the burden of proof will usually shift to the party accepting the notice early. Since the claimant provided sufficient, sufficient, can't say it, greater than two weeks of notice and the employer accepted it almost three months early, the separation was a discharge and was a burden. The burden is on the employer to establish misconduct. The employer has not presented any evidence to establish the claimant committed misconduct. Modify the AT, no good cause, no misconduct, charge back, void, adequate response. Uh, the AT decision should be modified. I agree that the claimant's misplacement of the hearing notice does not constitute good cause for her non-appearance. Regarding the merits of this case, the job separation occurred when the city issued a stay-at-home order. As such, the claimant should be qualified for benefits due to the disaster and the employer should not be charged. However, a memo should be sent to investigate the claimant's availability for work due to child care. We should modify the AT decision. The claimant did not have good cause for a non-appearance, no voluntary leaving, no charge back, disaster. Sever adequate response and send a memo to UIA and OS to investigate the claimant's availability for work. Modify the AT. Claimant did not establish good cause for AT1. No misconduct, charge back, void adequate response. Short form. Yes, sir, Commissioner Dennison. Case 2616212, Commissioner Dennison. Uh, the claimant filed a late commission appeal because he provided TWC <coughs> with an incorrect mailing address. The claimant should have known that his actual apartment number would constitute the appropriate mailing address to receive his correspondence. As such, <coughs> his appeal is not timely and we do not have jurisdiction to consider the underlying merits of this case. Accordingly, we should dismiss the claimant's appeal to the commission as late, <coughs> late <coughs> excuse me, and leave the underlying determination in full force and effect. When the claimant filed for benefits, he provided a valid address and was the only address of which he was aware of. The claimant was not aware that the address was the only valid for, at, was only valid for large non-USPS mail. The decisions sent to that address were returned to TWC. As soon as the claimant realized there was an issue, he diligently worked to discover the correct address for USPS mail and corrected the address with the commission. As the claimant provided the only address of which he knew, corrected the issue when he discovered it was insufficient for TWC mail and did not receive the, deci the decision, his appeal should be deemed timely and remanded to address the correct job separation. Deem claimant appeal timely and remand. If my fellow commissioners do not agree to de deem the appeal timely, the AT decision failed to address the appropriate job separation as the, the decision is erroneous, erroneous on its face the decision should be voided and the case remanded to the AT to address the appropriate separation. Timely commission appeal remand. In the short form. Yes, sir. Thank you. <coughs> case 2633814, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant has provided credible testimony that the employer was not following COVID-19 safety protocols, including the absence of appropriate PPE for the claimant. The claimant also provided testimony from a disinterested witness confirming that the safety protocols were not being followed and the work environment was unsafe. The employer has not provided any evidence to establish the work environment was safe. As the separation was a result of the pandemic, it would be appropriate to protect the employer's account from charge. Reverse EAT, no voluntary leaving, no charge back, disaster. Agree with that. Uh, based on the record in this case, I would agree to qualify the claimant under the disaster provisions of the act. <coughs> we should modify the AT decision, no voluntary leaving, no charge back, separation due to disaster. Agreed. Thank you. We have a unanimous <coughs> decision. Case 2634875, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision is not supportable. In late April or early May 2021, the employer announced that the claimant would be receiving an effective reduction in pay of 25%. The claimant quit as a result. Commission presidents has long held that a reduction in pay of greater than 20% constitutes good cause connected with the work to resign. The claimant should not be disqualified under Section 207.045 of the Act. 
reverse the AT, no voluntary leaving, charge back. Uh, the AT decision should be affirmed. The claimant provides several reasons for quitting, none of which qualify him for benefits. The record does not support a qualification due to MDI, and the requirement that the claimant comply with the local travel restrictions was reasonable. In addition, the claimant accepted his workload by performing the same job duties for approximately six months. He did not address any alleged concerns with the employer prior to resigning, nor did he establish that his working conditions were intolerable. Finally, the claimant did not provide specific details as to when and how his pay would be reduced in the future, thereby failing to establish a substantial change to his hiring agreement. The claimant's reason for resigning, while compelling, are personal in nature and do not constitute good work-connected cause for quitting. Accordingly, we should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Short form dissent? Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. <coughs> Case 268204, Commissioner Alvarez. The claimant's motion for rehearing should be granted. The claimant quit the job because of a hostile work environment created by her supervisor. The claimant has provided new evidence that the employer conducted an investigation of, of the supervisor and concluded that she engaged in disruptive behavior in the workplace and created a hostile work environment. The claimant had a compelling reason for not offering this evidence sooner because she was only given the results of the investigation on April 30th, 2021. The evidence, the evidence could change the outcome of the case because it's, it is strong cooperation of the claimant's testimony about what she had to endure with, it, with her supervisor. The claimant has met all three requirements for the rehearing. Grant the motion for rehearing. The claimant's MR should be denied. The claimant did not actually submit new evidence and therefore fails to meet the first criterion. Even if we can consider the claimant's statements are as new evidence, the outcome of the case would not change since the facts would still establish that the claimant quit in anticipation of discharge when her job was not in jeopardy. Since the claimant failed to meet all three requirements for a successful MR, her motion for rehearing should be denied. Deny the motion for rehearing. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 26. Pardon me, 2705352, Commissioner Demerson. The appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant was discharged for failure to follow instructions. Specifically, the claimant failed to attend requested meetings. While the claimant test claimant's testimony identifies one specific incident in which she could not attend a requested meeting due to homeschooling, the employer listed additional instances of the claimant failing to attend meetings in file documents. Eventually, the claimant notified the employer that she would not be unavailable for several days. Since the claimant was asked to make herself available for meetings, but failed to do so, her actions were mismanagement of her position of employment and misconduct connected with the work. <clears throat> we should therefore affirm the AT decision, misconduct, no chargeback. The decision should be reversed. The claimant submitted a letter of resignation with more than two weeks notice. Because the claimant was separated for more than two weeks prior to the effective date of that notice, the job separation was a discharge and the employer bears a burden of establishing the claimant committed misconduct. The claimant denied the employer's allegations under oath. The employer failed to appear to provide sworn testimony. The evidence fails to establish misconduct connected with the work. Reverse AT, no misconduct chargeback. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, charge back. Memo to investigate possible unreported earnings. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Demerson. We will send that memo. Case 2705519, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. After being laid off from his salaried sales director position at a hotel and receiving benefits, the claimant accepted a part-time position at a retail store. The new position was not suitable for the claimant as it paid far below his maximum wage demand. Although the hours were minimal, they regularly changed and prevented, he, prevented, he, prevented the claimant from interviewing for full-time work in his normal field on multiple occasions. The claimant was told by two TWC representatives that quitting his part-time position would not prevent him from receiving benefits as the, posi the position did not pay enough. Although one of the representatives stated that they could not instruct him to quit, the other one made no disclaimer. The claimant had also received information from his previous employer explaining they might reopen soon. While partially, while partially unemployed and on advice of the TWC representatives, the claimant quit suitable 
unsuitable employment so that it would be possible for him to accept employment that would increase his weekly wage. The claimant should be qualified for benefits under Section 207.045G of the Act. Reverse the 18, no voluntary leaving, no overpayment. If my fellow commissioners are unwilling to reverse the separation in this case, then the claimant's overpayment should be deemed non-collectible in accordance with Martinez versus TEC 570 Southwest 2nd 28. 20, 2nd 28. Well, here, the overpayment arose because the claimant followed erroneous advice provided to him by TWC representatives. As such, it is not collectible under Section 214002 of the Act. The AT decision should be affirmed. The facts established that the claimant quit her, his position with the employer to seek other employment. The claimant could have continued his work search activities while maintaining his part-time employment. Furthermore, the evidence is insufficient to support that the claimant was misinformed by a TWC representative. <clears throat> Under the facts of this case, the claimant quit without work connected good cause, and his disqualification from benefits is appropriate. We should affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, overpayment of three thousand six hundred and forty seven dollars. Affirm the AT voluntary leaving overpayment. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case two seven two four nine eight nine, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. I agree that the claimant filed a late appeal. However, the commission can assume jurisdiction as early as June twenty fifth. The claimant testified that she repeatedly tried to contact the commission to provide the request information, the requested information. Accordingly, the ineligibility should be closed as soon as the commission has jurisdiction to do so. Modify the AT late claimant appeal reporting ineligibility from June 14, 2020 through June 27, 2020. The AT decision should be affirmed. Regarding timeliness, the claimant signed up for electronic correspondence and received notice of the determination via her electronic inbox. Despite being the appellant in this case, the claimant failed to check her inbox until three days after the appeal deadline had passed. The claimant was not prevented from checking her mail due to circumstances beyond her control. Accordingly, her appeal was not timely. As to reporting, the ineligibility period is appropriate. The claimant received an information request on June 4, 2020 with specific instructions on what to provide to TWC. However, the claimant did not open the correspondence until August 13, 2020, the same day she reported to the agency. She did not establish that any computer errors or attempts to contact TWC contributed to her delay in opening her electronic correspondence. In addition, the closure date is appropriate based on the date the claimant provided the requested information to TWC. We should therefore affirm the AT decision, untimely claimant appeal, reporting not eligible from June 14, 2020 through August 15, 2020. Reverse the AT, timely claimant appeal, uh, reporting ineligible from June 14, 2020 to August 15, 2020. We have a majority vote that this, the appeal was late. We also have a majority vote on the date for the reporting and eligibility. Uh, those dates don't match your vote, Commissioner Alvarez. Short form dissent. Thank you, sir. Case 2747518, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision should be reversed. The claimant was diagnosed with a serious illness and was informed by his physician that he would need treatment for six to eight weeks during which he would become seriously ill. The claimant contacted the employer about this, his options. He was not eligible for FMLA because of the length of his employment. He sought approval for the employer's qualified medical leave program, but therefore he could not have the required forms filled out by his doctor. He was informed that there were no more slots in the program. He resigned as a result. The claimant has provided documentation to the commission of his illness. The claimant was separated as a result of the medically verified illness, and he should be and he should therefore be not he should therefore not be disqualified. Reverse AAT, no voluntary leaving bill reimbursed an employer. The appeal tribunal decision should be modified. The claimant stated that he resigned from his position due to medical reasons. However, the claimant did not provide the employer with the appropriate documentation to grant medical leave. In addition, the employer stated that the claimant did not see if he could get an extension to submit the proper documentation. As such, the claimant quit without work-connected good cause, and we should modify the AT decision. 
voluntary leaving, reimbursing them for not bill, sever adequate response. Modify the AT, voluntary leaving, reimbursing employer, not build, sever adequate response. Short form dissent? Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2755256, Commissioner Alvarez. The MR should be granted. The claimant has provided a signed notarized declaration from the owner of the employer business stating that the claimant did not refuse any employment. The owner did not previously testify and has expressed a, and has expressed a desire to do so. The claimant did not leave, correction, the claimant did not have this information previously, and the employer's testimony could reverse the outcome in this case. Grant the motion for rehearing. The claimant's motion does not meet all the required criteria for a successful MR. Accordingly, we should deny the claimant's motion for rehearing. Deny the motion for rehearing. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2766182, Commissioner Alvarez. The claimant was discharged by the employer's attorney after stating her intentions to take leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. The claimant's son had been exposed to the virus and the claimant was directed to quarantine by her child's doctor. The claimant provided me medical documentation to the employer and all information required under the act. The employer was upset. The claimant was intending to take leave and referred it to their attorney. The employer's attorney discharged the claimant falsely alleging it was due to her job performance. The claimant had no prior warnings and the employer admitted in the hearing her performance was unrelated to her discharge. The employer has asserted their attorney told them they were not covered by the act. However, no evidence has been provided to the commission to establish they are not covered and the employer's attorney admits the claimant entitled, is entitled to some leave under the act. Furthermore, although the employer alleges the claimant could have worked from home the claimant was, has provided text messages showing she inquired about working from home and was informed the employer was not changing, was not changing and she should not need and she would need to work from the office. The claimant's discharge for attempting to take leave she believed was legally entitled to under the act is potentially illegal and not misconduct connected with the work. Modify the AT, no misconduct, charge back, sever reporting. The appeal, the appeal tribunal decision should be modified. I agree that the reporting issue should be severed. As to the job separation, the claimant unilaterally demanded that she take paid leave for an extended period of time. However, the employer stated that the claimant was offered a chance to work from home. In addition, the employer also stated it was willing to allow the claimant to work from home, but she chose not to. As such, misconduct was established. We should therefore modify the AT decision. Misconduct, no charge back sever the reporting issue. Modify the AT, misconduct, no chargeback, sever reporting issue. Short form dissent? Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2785940, Commissioner Demerson. We should grant a rehearing in this case. The record was not adequately developed regarding the reasons for the claimant's discharge. In its response to the claim, the employer noted that the claimant was discharged for falsification of time records. The employer includes, included details of multiple instances during the claimant's final week of work where he spent several hours at his girlfriend's house while clocked in. The employer also provided GPS documentation of these laps and a statement from the HR director which documented the claimant's admission that he was visiting his girl at her apartment for several days without permission while on the clock. Because falsification of time was one of the primary reasons for the claimant's discharge and the AT did not question the parties about this matter or confront the claimant with the employer's documented allegations, we should rehear this case for proper development of this issue. The decision should be affirmed. The claimant used a company vehicle to assist a coworker with the task. The claimant had done this previously without objection from the employer. While the claimant was warned in 2019, he continued to use a company vehicle in this manner with the employer's knowledge until he was discharged in 2021. Similar to the case cited by the AT, the employer condoned the claimant's actions. Therefore, the employer has not shown misconduct. Affirm the AT, no misconduct, charge back. Reverse the AT, misconduct, no charge back, adequate employer response. The chairman agree with the chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Demerson. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2786248, Commissioner Demerson. 
we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. The employer discharged the claimant after receiving the claimant's positive drug test result. The employer is regulated by the Federal Transit Administration, the FTA, federal law, specifically 49 CFR 655.61, states that immediately after receiving notice from a medical review officer, an MRO, uh, that a covered employee has a verified positive drug test result, the employer shall require that the covered employee cease performing a safety-sensitive function. Because the claimant worked in a safety-sensitive position, upon learning of the claimant's positive results, the employer had no choice, as testified to, to by the general manager, but to follow FTA regulations and discharge the claimant. Because the parties agreed that the MRO later changed the drug test results from positive to negative, I agree that the claimant should be qualified for benefits. However, because the employer was required by federal law to stop the claimant from working in a safety-sensitive position upon receipt of the positive test results, the employer's accountant should be protected from charge. Accordingly, we should modify the AT decision, no misconduct, no chargeback, separation caused by operation of law. Ms. Miller, I would agree with Commissioner Demerson. Thank you. We have a unanimous decision. Case 2790-911, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be modified. Despite the fact that the claimant was released to full-time duty by the workers' compensation doctor, the claimant's personal doctor restricted the claimant to light duty. The claimant requested light duty from the employer. The employer refused to consider any type of accommodations for the claimant and discharged him without any further discussion. The claimant provided medical documentation demonstrating that he was not released to full duty. The employer discharged the claimant and has provided no evidence of misconduct on the part of the claimant. Modify the AT, no misconduct, no chargeback, MBI. The appeal, <coughs> the appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant received a medical release to return to full duty. Nonetheless, the claimant informed the employer that he would not be returning to his regular job due to being unfit for the position and requested a light duty supervisory role. There was no such position available. As such, since the claimant notified the employer he would not be returning to his regular job after receiving a medical release to return to full duty, he quit without work connected good cause. We should therefore affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, no chargeback. Short form dissent? Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2792478, Commissioner Demerson. We should modify the appeal tribunal decision. The parties agreed that the claimant quit <coughs> after she was diagnosed with COVID, <coughs> excuse me, and suffered complications from her illness. Thus, because the job separation was due to the claimant's illness, she should be qualified for benefits and the employer's account should be protected from charge under a medical separation analysis. We should modify the AT decision, no voluntary leaving, no chargeback, MDI. I would agree with Commissioner Demerson. Agreed. Thank you. We have a unanimous decision. Case 2793334, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision is not supportable. The claimant is the only party to provide first-hand testimony regarding the incidents leading to his resignation. The claimant had been yelled at on numerous occasions by his supervisors. The claimant informed HR of this issue. Although the employer provided second-hand testimony that the issue was not substantiated, subs subs whoa, substain, subs I cannot pronounce that today. The employer apparently found that the matter serious enough to look into the transfer. The employer was unable to transfer the claimant. After returning from a medical leave, the claimant was assigned a grant, a correction. After returning from the medical leave, the claimant was again yelled at by his supervisor and quit. As the claimant brought the matter to the employer on multiple occasions and provided the employer with ample time to rectify the situation, the claimant had good cause to quit. Reverse AT, no voluntary leaving, no overpayment. Uh, the appeal tribunal decision should be affirmed. The claimant quit over his concerns with management. The employer stated that it conducted an investigation and determined that the claimant's allegations were unsubstantiated. Subsequently, after returning from leave, the claimant had an interaction with the supervisor and immediately quit thereafter. Since the claimant did not afford the employer an adequate opportunity to address his most recent concern, he quit without work-connected good cause. 
we should affir therefore affirm the AT decision, voluntary leaving, overpayment of $7,294. Affirm the AT, voluntary leaving, overpayment. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. <coughs> Case 2800582, Commissioner Demerson. We should modify the appeal tribunal decision. The parties agreed that the claimant stopped performing services for pay due to an injury. Thus, because the job separation was caused by the claimant's medical condition, the claimant should be qualified for benefits and the employer's account should be protected under a medical separation analysis. Accordingly, we should modify the AT decision. No misconduct, no chargeback, MVI. I would agree with Commissioner Demerson. Agreed. Thank you. We have a unanimous decision. Case 2803065, Commissioner Alvarez. The decision should be reversed. The employer has provided only hearsay, te hearsay testimony to support its allegation that the claimant was walking the property with a handgun. The claimant denied doing so. The claimant, who has concealed carry permit, admitted to having a handgun in his vehicle, which was parked in a lot provided was, was, which was parked in a lot provided by the employer. Texas Labor Code 52.061 requires employers to allow employees with concealed carry, concealed carry permits to keep handguns locked in their vehicles. The evidence provided by the employer fails to establish misconduct. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, bill reimbursement employer. Uh, we should modify the appeal tribunal decision. Because the claimant was in possession of a firearm on the employer's premises in violation of policy, the disqualification is appropriate. We should modify the AT decision, misconduct, reimburse an employer, not bills, add an adequate response ruling. Reverse the AT, no misconduct, bill reimburse an employer. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Demerson. Case 2805142, Commissioner Alvarez. The AT decision is not supportable. The claimant was a program director who was basically responsible for auditing case files and ensuring that those cases complied with the employer's legal and procedural requirements under the claimant's management were supervisors who supervised caseworkers. A child assigned to one of those caseworkers died, and the employer has apparently chosen to hold the claimant responsible. The claimant reviewed the, ca the child's case file for more than, one, more than once and directed the supervisors and case managers to take the required actions to make the case compliant. The employer provided hearsay testimony from the supervisor and case manager at the time of the child's death that the claimant had directed, directed them not to take the required actions. They did not testify in the AT hearing and clearly had a motive to provide untrue statements. The credible first-hand evidence establishes that the claimant performed her job according to the employer's standards. The employer has provided no evidence to establish that the claimant has, was somehow responsible for the child's death. The employer failed to provide sufficient credible evidence to the claimant's misconduct. Reverse AT, no misconduct, bill reimburse an employer. Uh, we should affirm the appeal tribunal decision. Several months before the child's death, the claimant was aware that certain steps regarding the child's safety plan had not been implemented. In her position of program director, she should have ensured that the safety protocols were followed. Thus, because the claimant did not provide proper oversight and supervision to her subordinates, did not ensure that the child's safety plan policies were followed, the claimant mismanaged her position of employment. We should affirm the AT decision, misconduct, reimburse an employer, not bills. Affirm the AT, misconduct, reimburse an employer, not bills. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. Case 2807-387, Commissioner Demerson. We should reverse the appeal tribunal decision. Although the employer's appeal was sent through the postal service, PwC records do not contain a copy of the corresponding envelope. The agency is supposed to scan copies of the envelopes because for mailed items, we measure timeliness from the date of the postmark and not from the date that the item was received by TWC. In the absence of a postmark, timeliness is then measured by counting back to a date that precedes the date we received the item. The employer's appeal contains two receipt stamps, one dated July 13th and the other July 27th. The employer testified that its office did not date stamp the appeal. This makes logical sense since it is common practice to date stamp incoming items and not outgoing items. This leads us to the conclusion that the item was received by TWC on July 13th. 
which would make the appeal timely, even if the document was received by appeals until later. In conjunction with the employer's testimony that the appeal was mailed on July 8th, the evidence supports the conclusion that the employer filed a timely appeal. We should not penalize the employer because we did not preserve a copy of the envelope. As to the merits, because the job separation resulted from the claimant simply walking out of her owner job, the employer's account should not be charged. Accordingly, we should reverse the AT decision. The employer filed a timely appeal, no chargeback. The decision should be affirmed. The employer filed a late appeal. The employer was unable to provide a reason for their late appeal, and it appears to have been caused by their own faulty mail handling procedures. As the employer did not file a timely appeal, the determination should be left in effect. Affirm the AT late employer appeal chargeback. Reverse the AT timely employer appeal, no chargeback. Short form dissent. Yes, sir, Commissioner Alvarez. And that was the last UI case pulled for additional discussion on docket 23. You should have received the UI short form dissent move for docket 23. I move to accept staff recommendations on the remaining UI cases on docket 23. I second the motion except for those cases in which I'm dissenting. As reflected on the UI short form dissent list for docket 23. I concur with the chairman's motion except for the cases on which I'm dissenting as reflected in the UI short form dissent list for docket 23. Motion passes with the exception of Garrett. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This brings us to the end of agenda items 337. Let's take a short break to reset for the rest of the meeting. He did it slow though, sir. Thank you. You need to slow down. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Aaron, you think we did it? <laughs> Thanks, Aaron.
And we're back. Gen item eight has been postponed to a future meeting. Gen item nine, discussion, consideration, possible action regarding an order under sections 204067 and 20301.105 of the Texas Unemployment Compensation Act to adjust rate components of the 2021 unemployment uh, insurance <coughs> tax rate. All right, so, uh, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Take it away. Good morning, Chairman, uh, Commissioners, Mr. Cerner, for the record, Chris Nelson, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, as, I, as I proceed through my presentation, there's a couple things that uh, technical edits and clarifications that should have been brought to your attention in the briefings, and they weren't, and I, and I take responsibility for that. So I'll make a note in my comments about changes. Uh, it doesn't change the options that will be laid out. It does change uh, your understanding of the options that are being presented and to clarify so that you're making the, the best possible decision with the best information and accurate information that you have. So I'll, I'll kind of point those out as we get through them in the discussion paper. Uh, as you were aware, on February 14, 2021, TWC delayed setting the 2021 unemployment insurance tax rates to allow more time for legislative efforts to, that could impact employer rates. On May 13, 2021, Governor Abbott signed into law House Bill 7 of the 87th Texas Legislature. In accordance with the passage of HB 7, COVID-19 non-effective charges are removed from the replenishment ratio of the unemployment insurance general tax. For tax year 2021, $5.2 billion in COVID-19 non-effective charges have been identified, and half of those would have been used in the replenishment ratio. Uh, the replenishment ratio under HB 7 is calculated as 1.37. Without HB 7, the replenishment ratio would have been 2.66, and for reference, the 2020 replenishment ratio was 1.32. The replenishment ratio in con conjunction with the employer's benefit ratio determines the employer's general tax rate. I note this as informational only as the commission do not have statutory authority to adjust the general tax rate. There are several unemployment insurance ta taxes that the commission do have the authority to adjust and set before you is a discussion paper that lays out those rates and options for setting those rates. And again, as I go along, I'll make some uh, comments to, to correct the record on a few of them. Uh, the first rate is the replenishment tax rate. This rate is designed to recoup the other half of non-effective charges. Uh, as I stated, well, TWC delayed setting rates, but on April 30th, when the first quarter taxes are normally due, 438,000 Texas employers paid their estimated first quarter 2021 tax rates, and it seems virtually all of them used a 2020 tax rate as a basis for paying the first quarter remittances. Uh, I would like to clarify at this time, on page two of your discussion paper, there's a reference to over 300,000 that paid. Uh, that number should be 438,000, which is consistent with the number that was actually on page one, uh, just for, for clarification. Hey, Chris. Yes. Uh, Mr. Tobin, so uh, if there's no objection from any commissioner, uh, obviously Chris is gonna finish, we're gonna do what we're gonna do here today. But could I ask that the corrections be made to the paper and then placed in the record as a corrected document just so that our historical record is complete and correct here? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I would also like to clarify something that was not clear in the discussion paper uh, and probably the briefings in the three options. If the commi there's three options for laid out in the paper. If the commission were to choose option one and set the rate to 0.18%, and the obligation assessment to 0.03%, then all employers uh, that paid the minimum tax rate would actually receive a credit because the obligation assessment is experience rated. So if you pay the minimum rate, you don't have a basically a benefit ratio, and so you would not pay the 0.03. So I don't think that was clear in the, uh, in the briefings, and so I wanted to clarify that, and that's my responsibility. I'm sorry for the not clarifying that during the briefings. Uh, if the commission were to set option two of setting the replenishment ratio to 0.21, then all employers that paid the minimum tax rate would have the same rate as 2020 because they wouldn't pay the 0.03 obligation assessment since they do not have a benefit ratio um, in the 2021 rates. 
effectively the only employers that would be affected by the 0.18 would be those at the maximum rate uh, if, if you choose that option. And again, my apologies for the lack of clarity on that. Uh, and, and for reference, 355,000 employers in 2020 paid the minimum tax rate. Uh, staff are projecting that number to be slightly higher in 2021, but, but we won't have the official numbers until the actual jobs run. So 355,000 employ 355, employers roughly would have the same tax rate as 2020 if you set, if you chose option two for your clarification. The next rate is a deficit tax rate. This rate is designed to bring the unemployment insurance trust fund to the statutory floor of 1% of taxable wages. Although the commission can adjust this rate to any percent up to, two, up to the maximum 2%, Staff are only presenting an option to set this rate to 0% for tax year 2021. Uh, and I'd like to point out any adjustments to the replenishment and deficit tax rate from their calculate, calculated levels could very likely set into play uh, a future decision on the, for the commission to take up on the issuance of bonds. As there are other legislative decisions that could impact the need and or amount of a future bond issuance and the fact that the trigger for Texas employers to begin losing their future tax credit, which is currently 90%, isn't until November of 2022. I'm not bringing forward a decision on the issuance of bonds at this time, and will probably not do so until the early fall of 2021. The last tax rate previously mentioned is the obligation assessment necessary to collect the funds sufficient to pay the interest on Title 12 loans that could be due on September 30th, 2021. If there is no extension on the current interest-free period, if there is no extension on the interest free period. In accordance with TWC rules, the rate necessary would be 0.03%. Uh, that concludes I, my remarks. I'd be happy to answer any questions or clarify anything. Scott, any questions or comments? None here at this uh, point. <coughs> I, I do. Uh, so Chris, uh, in regards to option one at 0.18% um, and then option two, 0 0.21, if uh, we are to go with option one, uh, then you're saying there's a, uh, uh, a number of employers out there that would be in a refund uh, position? Correct, because they, mo what it seems like is most employers that paid that first quarter, they sent us the cash even though they didn't have a rate right. officially given to them. It looks like they paid using their 2020 rates. Right. So all those employers that sent cash based, based off um, their 2020, say they had the minimum rates, 355,000 mm -hmm. of them had the minimum rate of 0.21. Mm -hmm. If you assign a, a, a replenishment tax of 0.18, that would be their tax because they don't they would not pay the obligation, obligation assessment of 0.03. Okay. So they would be due a credit of 0.03. Got it. So that is and that was not clarified in the briefings, and that's that's my, my failure. My apologies. So. That, that's okay. It's good. It's good to see that employers were paying in advance as well. Right. So yes. Good to see that. All right. That's so it's if you, if you if you chose option two, those 355 plus thousand employers would have the same effective tax rate as 2020. Mm -hmm. So the, the refund position, would that uh, put our staff in any peculiar situations in terms of uh, uh, operations? I don't know if it would put them in any particular situation. Uh, I, I know there's probably an, over, an, an administrative uh, issue, burden, but I, I don't know how, I don't, it's not to my knowledge, it wouldn't be that difficult to okay. deal with, right. but it, uh, it's just one more administrative thing to, to work right. out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to clarify, so uh, if the replenishment tax rate were to be set at 0.21%, that would be the same replenishment tax rate as we saw in tax year 2020. That is correct, sir. All right. Yes. Uh, Effectively, if you, if, if you chose option two, you would have the most employers with the same tax rate as 2020, since 355,000 plus of the, of the Texas employers pay the minimum tax rate. Well, so, I mean, so if I remember our earlier discussion, which was what, uh, January, February timeframe, um, you know, at least my intent was and has been, and actually continues to remain, a desire not to see just a huge spike up in rates. And so it strikes me that if 
even selecting option two, um, deficit tax rate at, at zero, as you've, you've recommended, mm -hmm. and then this recommendation for a 0.03% obligation assessment rate. Um, the, the rates for tax year 21 would be substantially similar. The different, one difference being um, the, the addition of the 0.03% uh, obligation assessment, but we didn't have a need for that. So that, that, that kind of sits outside of where we were in 2020 and something that we didn't even have to contemplate in 2020. Correct. The, 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 there was no need to borrow in 2020, so there was no obligation assessment. Uh, and so the 0.03 is something new, mm -hmm. and, and it's totally subject to congressional approval. The con con Congress could extend that period, that interest fee period, which ends September 6th. They could extend it further. We won't know that until probably right before we have to pay. So you have kind of one option now to kind of set aside funds to, to pay that interest if it's possibly due. But, but, but there's, there's repercussions if the interest charges aren't addressed, um, if indeed we do incur some interest charges. Correct. We would have to probably work with the financing authority to figure out some short-term financing okay. options to, to pay that interest. Uh, ju just for point of clarification, so um, the, the no, not the replenishment tax rate, but the replenishment ratio from the general tax, um, even with the uh, adjustments that were made with the passage of House Bill 7, we're going to see a slight increase to that ratio f for some what appears to be some non-COVID related, uh, perhaps early 2020, uh, calendar year 2020 layoffs. That is, that is correct. It does not bring it back to the 1.32 you saw in 2020, but it brings it to 1.37, which is within the normal range of where we see the replenishment ratio. It usually fluctuates between one one point two something and you know right below one point four something is 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 a normal range for the replenishment ratio. So just just for transparency purposes, uh, do, does that mean then that uh, experience rated employers will will see a slight increase in their in their tax rate? That is correct. The, the replenishment ratio acts as a multiplier. It, it takes your 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 benefit ratio, which is your experience rated portion. And it says, what do I need to multiply that by to collect enough revenue to, to cover these non-effective charges that we can't assign to a specific employer? And so uh, with the going from 1.32 to 1.37, even if you had the same benefit ratio as last year, you will see a slight increase to your taxes um, if you do have a chargeback within the last 36 months. And, and I mean, House Bill 7 provided a, a great deal of relief to employers for the five plus billion dollars that uh, were non-effective charges resulting from COVID-19. But, but in fact, there are still non-effective charges that, that there, were not related to COVID. There are still non-effective charges, and they're, they're virtually is every year. Uh, but the fact that it brought it down from 2.66, which is an astronomical, I mean, we've never even remotely seen anything close to that. The fact that it brought it down from 2.66 to 1.37 is, is a good indication that HB7, it seems like, did what it was intended to do, which was remove the impact of COVID uh, on the replenishment ratio. So, so uh, you know, it's my opinion that, that commissioners here have a dual responsibility. We. We have a responsibility to protect the financial integrity of the fund to make sure that, that we have funds available to pay unemployment benefits. That's, that's an important responsibility that we have. And I think we adopted uh, at least um, each, perhaps in our own way, in, in February, a desire to mitigate the, the short-term COVID effects on employers. Um, I mean, it's my opinion, and I think we've succeeded at that. Uh, your report would suggest to me that you believe that this puts the fund uh, on as sound a financial footing as we can while sort of protecting the, the short-term effects of uh, potential tax increases. The open question now remaining, you know, what we do to finance um, the charges for the non-effective charges and some other things that are, in, I, I guess, in essence, are still pending. Correct. Okay. There, like I said, there, 
there will have to, if, if you choose to set the rates at a lower than what they're calculated to be, uh, you will have to take up a decision at some point, barring any, you know, cash infusion that would make the trust fund whole, but you would have to take up a decision at some point. But knowing that there's other possible decisions that could impact how much you need, we would need to go and issue bonds for, uh, at this point, I think it's kind of premature to, to kind of make that decision until you know where the, you know, what, where the field is after everything, all the dust settles. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Other, other questions or comments? Yeah, yeah, Chris, so, so between options one, one and two, uh, which, which would require the least follow-up action by staff? Uh, with option, employers? Two, option two would, would, would require the least follow-up action with okay. employers. It would those, those employers that have already paid their taxes. Yes, so option those two that have already paid, the, let's say there's 355,000 again that mm -hmm. paid the minimum rate. Mm -hmm. Those that paid their first quarter taxes, even though they didn't get a tax bill from us, they would n require no future follow-up. Okay. They're, they're whole. They, okay. they paid 0.21. And they're solid, and we'll assess 0 0.21. Sounds good. All right, thank you. And that's like somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of employers. Is that right? Cor correct. I believe in 2020 it was about 67 percent of employers that paid the minimum tax rate. Our, our projections right now are it's about probably going to be closer to 70 percent of employers will pay the minimum tax rate for 2021. And what percentage of employers uh, made this this? It's not really voluntary because we were going to ultimately come to it, but what percentage of employers made the payment on the old schedule? It's also between 60 and 70 percent, is it not? Correct. Is it fair? About 82 I'm editorializing here, but is it fair to say? I believe that's about 82 percent that, that actually paid. Even better. Rick? Chairman, I appreciate the questions and the presentation you made. You certainly clarified a lot of stuff, Chris. I mean... Uh, yeah, my, my apologies for, for not mm -hmm. being more thorough in the briefings and, and making sure we're, we're fully understanding what's being presented. So my apologies again. I hate to do it to you at the, the, the we can dais, that later, but Chris. You, you I want to make my, sure you uh, have uh, all the information. In regards to uh, the least amount is option two in terms of the impact. That is correct. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, well, so we have three decision points, Chris, for you, right? We yes. need to decide on the replenishment tax rate, we need to decide on the deficit tax rate, and then we need to decide on the obligation assessment rate. That is correct. I mean, I think at least on the, the first two, I know these rates are, are, already, are kind of pre-calculated, and it takes a commission decision to set them something lower than what they're calculated to be. So we would need three separate decisions. Okay. Um, is it agreeable, gentlemen, to uh, take them up one by one just so that we yes, can right. on here? Yeah, yes, that, that's the proper move. Okay, so uh, if let's do it in order that they were listed. So the first is the replenishment tax rate. Staff's presented us uh, three options, and we would need to decide on one of those options or an option of our own choosing. Right, but that's correct. I'm hoping we can select from one of these mm -hmm. three options. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'd like to move if it's proper. Yes. Mm -hmm to do so. So, <clears throat> so uh, in regards to the motion for the uh, replenishment tax rate, uh, in accordance with the authority granted by the Texas Labor Code, Section 204.067, I move that the Texas Workforce Commission adjust the replenishment tax rate for 2021 to 0.21%. That would be option two as presented by staff. I would second that motion. I'll agree to that. All right. We'll show that as unanimous on the deficit tax rate. So, Mr. Chairman, on, on the uh, deficit tax rate, deficit assessment rate, uh, in accordance with the authority granted by the Texas Labor Code, Section 204.067, I move that the Texas Workforce Commission adjust the deficit tax rate for 2021 to zero. Chairman, I would agree to that. Okay. Also agreed. We're unanimous. Now the obligation assessment rate. And so lastly, a motion to set the unemployment obligation assessment rate in accordance with the requirements of the Texas Labor Code, Section 203.105 and TWC Rule 815.132, I move that the Texas Workforce Commission set the unemployment obligation assessment rate for 2021 to 0.03%.
I would agree to that. Also agreed. That's unanimous as well. Do you need Thank anything you. else from us on this? I need nothing else at this time. Thank you. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Chairman, before Chris ends, I'd like to just thank you for your mm -hmm. work on, on this uh, particular issue and Commissioner Alvarez as well. Uh, a lot of hard work. Senator, uh, I mean, Senator Nelson and uh, uh, Chair um, Angie but Chen Budd uh, and, and the governor eventually signed in House Bill 7. A lot of that really played in, and I think our overall goal, I represent the employers, and the goal was to keep the tax rates as low as possible, and I, think, I know we've achieved that uh, through the action that we're taking today, but getting to this point was a lot of work, and I appreciate what you did early on in the process uh, to get this going. So thank you for your work in that respect. I would agree with uh, Commissioner Demerson. Uh, Chairman, great work on, on this um, and everything you did uh, to get us to this point and working closely with Chris. Uh, Chris can go back to an, a, a normal life, I think, uh, hopefully after this, right? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, but we'll talk about some of those minor things that you messed up on okay. prior to this. Okay. But I will tell you, great discussion and great questions, Chairman, th that were brought up. I mean, you certainly uh, brought to light some of the um, things. I was thinking of uh, the other option, but after listening to Chris's on the clarification points that were brought up by the commission, it certainly has brought light to the decision that I came up with, and I'm glad that we were unanimous on this. So thank both of you for the great work that you've done specifically on this agenda item. Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, commissioners. Um, I, I do want to double down on something Commissioner Demerson said uh, about the legislative and gubernatorial action on House Bill 7, which provided a great deal of um, workability for employers. And, and I think the net result of that, and, and we'll honestly, there's probably not an empirical way to measure this, but I, I think you'll find um, it preserves the ability for employers to continue to create jobs. Um, this is very premature for me to say this, but, but I, think, I think the evidence will bear out I think you're going to even see that there are new employers that have been added to uh, our tax rolls during the pandemic period, which means people created businesses mm -hmm. and they hired somebody because they're paying wages here um, that we're accounting for. And so um, when we look at the state's economy, uh, Chris, I promise it's not going to be my normal speech on the state's economy, but when we look at the state's economy, you know, we still see some highlights coming forward. We still see job creation and we're seeing new job creation. And so. Uh, you know, Commissioner Alvarez, Commissioner Demerson, thank you uh, for your teamwork on this, and, and uh, thank you to the legislature and the governor for, for taking up a very important issue in such a timely way and, and giving this commission some tools um, that we could use to do our small part to help the state's economy continue to grow. And then finally, to Chris, Ed, Randy, Tom, and all the rest, Clay, all the rest, uh, of folks that worked on this, um, including the general counsel's office, um, we, we've been working on this issue since uh, about September of last year. Uh, it was a long and arduous process. I appreciate staff sticking with us. And uh, we, we, um, we, we put a lot of work into this because it's important to a lot of people, every Texan, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, I appreciate you guys uh, spending a lot of late nights on this and, and helping get this uh, in such a form that we could do this today. Well, so thank you. Definitely a team effort. And, and I will say, you know, the, what, what I have learned about the unemployment insurance tax rates is they are designed to recoup money very fastly. And so if we paid out just under $8.7 billion in benefits without legislative action that you've already mentioned that helped, without con commission action which you've just taken, this system is designed to recoup that kind of money in a very short period of time which probably is w was not in the best interest of employers. So. Uh, not that it means the money has to come from somewhere, but uh, collecting, you know, roughly $8 billion in one year is probably not in the best interest of, of the Texas economy at this time. Thank you. Chairman, what did some of the other states do? Uh, Commissioner Alvarez just asked me what some other states did. Mm -hmm. Some states pressed forward with their, um, just their mathematical computation, mm -hmm. thus raising rates um, exponentially wow. on employers. Wow. Some states um, who had the latitude, um, um, well, it's the vaguest term, but they mm -hmm. pushed. Um, mm -hmm. They some states um, had their commission or commissioner in, in some single mm -hmm. commissioner states. They had the latitude mm -hmm. to set the rate, and so they set the rate uh, based on 2020. Our mm -hmm. system is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because the general tax is statutorily mandated. Um, that was our need mm -hmm. to explore legislative options, which the legislature was interested in doing, and then 
you know, the, what, <coughs> what discretion our commission has. So it's, it's actually, based on what I've seen, Mr. Cerner may have different information, but um, mm -hmm. of the large mm -hmm. states, the states that, that we could compare mm -hmm. Texas to, a um, couple pushed, a couple just set the rates based on the calculation, mm -hmm. and a couple just adopted last yeah. year's rates. In essence, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're adopting last year's rates to bring some certainty to employers so we mm -hmm. can explore the most cost-effective yeah. option for the people of Texas in, in solving this that's problem. That's awesome. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we were able to do that. Uh, you know, it goes back to uh, uh, doing it because of the work that was put in uh, through House Bill 7 and, and other things. And oh, so yeah. it allows yeah. us to really make some good, good decisions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chris. I think I have the next. Do you have the next yeah, one? Yeah. That's why you keep waiting. I can go hey. sit down and come back. <laughs> the universal signal. Yes, go back and sit down. <laughs> you can join Kim and Amber and just do it like this. Okay. I'll move to the next item. Yeah. This is item 10, program year 2021, fiscal year 2022 allocations and distributions. This is also fiscal year 2021 allocation modifications and related performance expectations for workforce <coughs> development areas. Again, for the record, Chris Nelson, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, this morning you have before you the PY 2021 and FY 2022 WIOA and Adult Education and Literacy Allocations consistent with TWC rule, rules on allocations and available grant funding for your approval. Also included is the, the distribution for rapid response funding using WIOA dislocated worker funding. Both WIOA and Adult Ed uh, available funding is higher than last year's allocation, which is the driver behind the overall allocation increases for 2021 and 2022. Uh, these allocations will go into effect on contract uh, effective July 1, 2021. Uh, that concludes my remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Comments or questions? None here, Chairman. None? None. Is there a motion? So are we taking, are we motioning on? Uh, we'll do them one at a time. One at a time? For yeah. Okay. So... 10A, I move that we approve program year 2021, fiscal year 2022 allocations and distributions for WIOA adult, youth, dislocated worker, rapid response, and adult education and literacy as described by staff and order the executive director to administer these block grant allocations in the most feasible and economic manner within all guidelines prescribed by the General Appropriations Act, legislature, the Texas Labor Code, and TWC rules. Next, a second. Agreed. 10B, I move that we reduce fiscal year 2021 Wait, child care. Yeah, uh, I, I was just going to uh, make some comments on each one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, the, just kind of introduce them and if you want to do the motion after. Or you can do the motion. It's, let's, it's up to you all. Yeah, let's have Chris. Uh, the next item in your packet is, is a request to modify the FY 2021 child care allocation. Due to the effects of COVID-19 and decreased enrollments in 2021, staff are presenting an option to move $67,151,170 in funding from the 2021 allocation into the 2022 allocation, 2022 allocation. If approved, when we run the 2022 child care allocation later this summer, this modification would be added to the contracted amounts available for 2022. Also attached is the associated target modification for the children served that would also be moved from 2021 into 2022 if approved. Uh, that concludes my remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments? None here. Do we have a motion? Chris? I move that we reduce fiscal year 2021 child care allocations from local workforce development areas by $67,151,170 mm. $67, and increase the fiscal year 2022 allocations by the same amount. Second. <coughs> second. Should have moved second. Yeah, we're unanimous. The last item I have uh, in your packet is a request to modify the FY 2021 SNAP allocation. TWC, TWC has learned through HHSC, which is a lead agency for SNAP, that due to the service delivery changes implemented in response to COVID-19, Texas is no longer eligible to receive the projected 3.4 million in SNAP ABOD funding for 2021. Since this funding was formerly part of the allocation and contracts previously approved, the allocation and contracts need to be modified. Staff have identified 1.2 million in SNAP 5050 funds that could be added to the allocation, leaving an overall reduction of 2.2 million for 2021. That concludes my remarks and I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Questions or comments? None here, Chairman. Do we have a motion? I move that we reduce the fiscal year 2021 SNAP allocations to local workforce development areas by $2,202,000 $2 for fiscal year 2021 SNAP allocations of $18,995,355 as discussed by staff. A second. It's been moved, seconded. Where are you, Mike? Thank you. That's, that's all I have this morning. Thank you. This is agenda item 11, TRS, optimal use of the class assessment tool. Good morning, um, Chairman, Commissioners, and Mr. Cerna. Allison Wilson with Child Care and Early Learning, for the record. Texas Child Care and Quality Rating and Improvement System, Texas Rising Star, includes a set of measures in Category 2 that evaluate teacher-child interactions. Research shows that high-quality teacher-child interactions are associated with measurable positive impacts on child development. In addition to Texas Rising Star, there are other nationally available tools which also measure teacher-child interactions. The Classroom Assessment Scoring System, known as CLASS, is a widely used evidence-based tool that comprehensively measures the quality of teacher-child interactions. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uses CLASS within Head Start programs nationwide and several states also use CLASS within their child care quality rating and improvement systems. Additionally, several boards use CLASS to support their lo local child care quality improvement activities. While CLASS measures are not identical to Texas Rising Star Category 2 measures, CLASS measures are substantially similar. Because CLASS is already in use in several local communities throughout Texas, CLASS assessments could be used to demonstrate a provider's competency in meeting the Texas Rising Star T teacher child interactions measures. Staff seeks direction on recognizing class scored teacher child interactions towards Texas Rising Star certification as outlined in the discussion paper. And that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Comments or questions? None here, Chairman. None. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the optional use of class assessment tool to measure child care interactions in Texas Rising Star evaluations with the scoring matrix of this, as discussed by staff. A second. It's been moved, seconded, where you madam. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to uh, agenda item 12, statewide initiatives. Good morning, Chairman Daniel, Commissioners. Alvarez and Commissioner Demerson and Mr. Sarna, for the record, Leslie Cruz, Workforce Development Division. Before you for consideration is a discussion paper revising the adult, adult education and literacy career pathway professional development center request for applications approval. On April 20th, 2021, the commission approved $693,007 for a single award under the career pathway professional development career center RFA. During initial contract development with the grantee, it was determined that due to an error in the budget spreadsheet, the wrong proposed total for the application was included when the commission approved the grant award. The correct total for this grantee is $750,000, which is within the RFA budget as proposed and approved on July 28, 2020. Staff seeks consideration and commission approval to change the single grant award from the previous approved $693,007 to $750,000. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Comments or questions? None, Mr. Chairman. None. I have a quick comment and a, and a yes, sort of sir. a question. Is, is there a mechanism we can use to give you guys some not to exceed numbers? I mean, we, we approved up to 750,000. We're not exceeding that. I get the statutory reason why you got to bring this back to us like this, but yes, is sir. there a way to do this in the future where we can approve a, a top end amount and you guys have latitude to operate within that? We can, yep. I'll work with general counsel to see if there's something we can do. The statute that was passed was fairly specific concerning the requirements of the staff to bring these to the commission, but I'll work with general counsel staff to see if we have some flexibility. Yeah. And I, I, law is law. I'm, I'm perfectly uh, uh, understanding if the statute is that restrictive, and if it is, it is. I just, 
for staff to have to make technical corrections on something that we already approved an, an upper end amount without exceeding it. I'm just looking for options here. So, all right. Okay. Com other comments or questions? None here, Chairman. You know, here um, in the discussion paper, it, it actually the bullets uh, one grant award totaling up to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and so there may be some disagreements on there. Yeah, okay. So, is there a motion on this to go? Chairman, I move that we approve modifying the grant award for the AEO Career Pathway Professional Development Center from six hundred ninety-three thousand seven dollars to up to seven hundred fifty thousand, as presented by staff. Second. So move and second. Anyone unanimous? Our general counsel has advised that, the, that there's a little bit of lack of clarity on what we voted on in agenda item 10. So we're going to go back to agenda item 10 and just clarify exactly what the motions were and how the commission voted on those motions. So they're your motions, sir. And just we'll just make sure you've got everything in the record that, that you were wanting that they've captured what you've put in the record. Great. Thank you, Chairman. I move that we reduce fiscal year 2021 child care allocations for local workforce development areas by $67,151,170 and increase the fiscal year 2022 allocations by the same amount. Given the adjustments to fiscal year 2021 child care allocations, I further move that we reduce the corresponding fis uh, BCY 2021 child care targets by $11,985. The second, the second motion, uh, were the changes numerical or the changes to the motion? Are we just clarifying the motion? Yeah, I, there was a, a, a section there that I did not specify, and that was to further reduce the corresponding BCY 2021. Okay. Second. It's just the targets weren't included in there. Right. Yeah. I, I think the targets were included in the staff recommendation, but really the commission has to set those targets. And so rather than us just rely on the staff paper, I think we need to just vote on it. I'm voting aye as well. All right. Thank you. Mr. Trollman, clarified. Thank you. Anything under 13? Yes, sir. I have one item under agenda item 13 that I believe Clay Cole is going to bring up. I'm glad. I'm glad Clay is here. I, have <laughs> I keep a list of questions for him in my pocket. I hardly ever get to see good, him. Good morning, Chairman Daniel, Commissioner Alvarez, <laughs> Commissioner Dempson, <laughs> Mr. Cerner, for the record, Clay Cole, I'm upon the insurance division. And I am glad I'm here, too. I'm not on Zoom, frozen, or, you know. <laughs> Hey, unmute, stuck, unmute uh, yourself. Unmute. Stuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm muted. The anyway. only, problem, only problem, Clay, is you can't act like you have connectivity issues when you don't want to <laughs> yeah, answer our questions. Exactly. <laughs> Got to face the fact here. So uh, just happy to be here with you all this morning uh, and really happy and excited, too, just uh, to share that uh, just the trends we've seen over the last three weeks uh, on a weekly basis, our claims and calls continue uh, to reduce to levels that, uh, you know, we haven't seen since the pandemic. Um, and so near, not near pre-pandemic, but still uh, much better than where we've been. And uh, also our assignment inventory is the lowest since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So re really good trends there uh, and uh, happy we're moving in that direction. And a positive sign, like it was talked about earlier, uh, as people return to work. And, you know, that's our number one mission. And uh, that's what we, you know, strive to do uh, with our workforce partners. So. Today, though, I'm here just to make you aware that the job refusal uh, guidance that's associated with the COVID-19 emergency will be ending when Texas opts out uh, of most of the Federal CARES Act assistance on June 26, 2021. Uh, on June 16, 2020, the Commission demonstrated support of the program guidance to unemployment claimants concerning their continued eligibility for unemployment insurance benefits 
should they refuse suitable work. However, on May 17, 2021, Governor Greg Abbott informed U.S. Department of Labor Texas intends to opt out of further federal unemployment compensation related to COVID-19 pandemic effective benefit week ending June 26, 2021. This includes the $300 weekly unemployment supplemental for federal pandemic unemployment compensation program. So TWC is responding to Governor Abbott's actions by focusing on helping Texans get back to work. And as a result, the job refusal guidance outlined last year uh, is, is out of date at this time as we opt out beginning, uh, you know, at the end, June 26, 2021. So going forward, June 27, 2021, um, you know, we'll no longer be um, administering um, those pro federal programs that uh, were outlined by the governor to the Department of Labor going fo forward. TWC will continue to investigate suitable work issues on a case by case basis and will apply the TUCA and TWC rules to ensure all Texans are treated fairly uh, if they must refuse an offer for work. So this concludes my update and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Any comments or questions? Thank you, Clay, for all the work that you've done during this whole time. Please uh, inform your staff that we're very grateful for the work and the heart, everything you all have done. And I also agree with the regards to the suitable work. I would uh, ask that staff review each case individually, like you just stated, in accordance with standing policies and review any medical documentation to determine if work is suitable. Thank you. I do want to express those sentiments and appreciate the work that you guys are doing. And uh, uh, this one, so it, Clay, our agency staff members, are we confident that TWC would be in compliance with General Department of Labor UI program guidance uh, for regular state unemployment insurance benefits, you know, even under the president's executive order uh, from January 2021. And I know you guys have been working with our team on that, but wanted to make yes, sure sir. that we're, we're solid there. Yes, sir, we, we, okay. feel, we feel confident. Okay. We're feeling confident. Yeah, we're very pleased to hear you talk about uh, our ability to look at these individually. I, I just want to make sure every, every Texan who, who still finds themselves uh, on unemployment benefits and are still looking for a job um, that they have all rights of due process on that. So I, I appreciate your commitment to mm -hmm. that. I think it's important. Um, so, you know, some tough decisions are, are being made for, for you know, a lot of employers, a lot of uh, employees in the state in terms of, of people finding jobs. And, and we've seen a lot of job growth and a lot of job activity, um, even this calendar year. I think that's going to intensify, but in the meantime, you know, I think for our purposes, just knowing that, that everybody has a, has a fair look at that. And so I appreciate your commitment to that. You, need, you don't need action from no us. No action, this just is to make y'all okay. aware. Okay. Thank, Thank y'all you. for y'all support. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see, I don't think we have anything under agenda item 14, but do, do we have a legislative report? Yes, sir. Oh, we do. Yeah, they come in 10, 15, we're gonna put them together. Oh, we're just gonna run them all together? Just like same thing. Right. It's like a whole pack of legislative affairs people. <laughs> 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 We're happy. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Daniels, Commissioner Alvarez, Commissioner Demerson, Mr. Serna, uh, Tom McCarty, External Relations Director. Joining me today is Michael Britt. We've been saving the bulk of our comments for today for the legislative session. Uh, so we've, we're going to wrap, we're going to include 140 days into this. So I hope you all have something to drink up there. Uh, I'd also like to recognize government relations team that's joined us, Kim Berry, uh, Joe Dyer, Stephen Dellert, Betsy, Haw Betsy Hawkins, they are in the audience with us today. Tom, can they stand up or can we see them? Oh, they need to stand up. Yeah, where, where are they? So tell the names again, Tom. Uh, we got Joe, uh, Joe, we got Stephen, wave your hand, Stephen, Kim Berry, and Betsy Hawkins. Betsy, okay, good. And then not joining us today, it was unable to join us as a, uh, but he's here in memory is uh, Christopher Green. And then uh, also on Zoom will be uh, Allison Robertson. Um, so as you know, the 87 Texas legislature adjourned signing die last Monday, May the 21st. It was a slightly different uh, session for us than uh, previous sessions. Um, bills relating to TWC were the first bills filed in the House on uh, in November. And the last bill heard uh, by the House was also a TWC bill. 
uh, are related to TWC. So uh, we haven't quite done the bookends before uh, leading up to a legislative session. Uh, those bills were uh, House Bill 21, uh, that was the first bill filed, and then Senate Bill 518 uh, was the last bill heard, uh, if you're curious. Uh, during the 140 days of session, GR received over 18,700 constituent casework inquiries. Um, the unemployment insurance division was largely able to address those inquiries uh, within 24 hours of receipt, which allowed GR to follow up within, within our targeted 48 hours to respond back to legislative offices. In addition, the agency tracked over 1,150 11, bills and agency staff prepared over 2,000 impact cost analysis on legislation and around 100 staff contributed to this work that was invaluable in assisting both government relations and the finance department during the session. We would like to thank those who were called uh, upon to serve as resource witnesses on behalf of the agency and were often here before the sun was up and in some cases stayed well after five to fulfill this role. Uh, Mr. Cerna, Courtney Arbor, Carrie Ballas, Reagan Miller, Mary York, Brian Snoddy, Clay Cole, Ar Paul Carmona, Cheryl Fuller, Chuck Ross, Chris Oakley, and Mariana Vega. I, I do apologize if I left anybody off, but uh, we do appreciate their help in being resource witnesses for the agency. Uh, moving on uh, to the briefing, we'll give you an appropriations update and then the legislative initiatives as well. Uh, for appropriations, the TUC appropriations for the 22-23 biennium uh, under Senate Bill, uh, Senate Bill 1, uh, TWC was allocated $1.9 billion in fiscal year 22 and $1.87 billion in fiscal year 23. Uh, these are all funds. Uh, SB1 also approved all of TWC's capital budget exceptional item requests. These include requests related to the VR case management and monitoring system upgrades, the work opportunity tax credit system, and foreign labor certification application system, TWC internet site update, and unexpended balance authority for the TWIS and UI system upgrades, which were approved by the 86th legislature. SB1 also includes new riders for TWC. The bill includes a new rider that requires TWC to ensure that digital skill building is an explicitly permitted use of existing workforce development grant programs, that TWC shall utilize federal funds to provide digital skills building, device access, and digital su support for workers in workforce development programs. The bill also includes a rider that requires TWC to utilize federal UI funding to collect and report unemployment insurance claims by type, internet, phone, and other, and disaggregate claim counts data by age, education, race, es race ethnicity, sex, and the occupation of individuals requesting benefits by region. The rider further stipulates the data is to be used to target individuals for digital skills training or retraining and that the data should be reported publicly on the website. I'll let Michael provide you uh, all with an overview of TWC legislative proposals and other key legislation passed during the session. Thanks, Tom, and good morning, Commissioners and Mr. Cerna. For the record, Michael Britt, Governmental Relations. As Tom mentioned, I'll start off and give you a quick overview of the status of TWC's legislative proposals for the 87th session. Uh, the legislature passed six of TWC's seven legislative proposals. These were House Bill 1153 by Representative Vo, sponsored by Senator Birdwell, which was our legislative proposal related to Fair Housing Act amendments. House Bill 1792 by Representative Button and sponsored by Senator Zapparini, which is TWC's legislative proposal related to TRS assessors and evaluator functions. House Bill 1799 by Representative Button, also sponsored by Senator Zapparini, which is TWC's legislative proposal related to apprenticeship reporting requirement updates. Senate Bill 695 by Senator Zapparini and sponsored by Representative Hefner, which is TWC's legislative proposal related to notice of assessments and methods of service. Senate Bill 770 by Senator Hughes, sponsored by Representative Button, which is TWC's legislative proposal related to the self-sufficiency grant program amendments. And Senate Bill 818 by Senator Powell, sponsored by Representative Chris Turner, which is TWC's legislative proposal related to UI claims for individuals called to state and federal military service. I'm happy to report that to date, Governor Abbott has signed all of our legislative proposals into law except for uh, House Bill 1153. And the bills that have been signed are all effective uh, September 1st, 2021. Of course, the, governor, um, the governor's deadline to sign or veto legislation is June 20th of 2021. 
TWC's seventh legislative proposal, which was Senate Bill 819 by Senator Powell and was related to additional evidence in dom UI domestic violence cases, ultimately was not passed by the legislature. Uh, next, I will go through a few of the major bills related to TWC that were passed this session. As has previously been mentioned this morning, we had House Bill 7 by Representative Button, and that bill makes changes to the replenishment ratio used to determine an employer's unemployment compensation tax rate by excluding from ca the calculation of the re re replenishment ratio benefits not effectively charged to an employer's account as a result of an or order or proclamation by the governor declaring at least 50% of the counties in this state to be in a state of disaster or emergency. And that bill was signed and went into effect on May 13th. Uh, we had Senate Bill 1801 by Senator Zaffarini, and this bill requires TWC to accept repayment for overpaid unemployment insurance benefits in the form of a personal check, a cashier's check, money order, debit card, electronic check, or electronic, ch electronic funds transfer. Senate Bill 2099 by Senator Zaffarini. This bill requires that TWC establish a method for every individual who files a claim for unemployment insurance benefits to be able to check the status of their claim through one or more telephonic or electronic methods. And each of these methods must provide an option for the individual to provide their name and contact information and receive a return phone call or email response from TWC within a reasonable time frame regarding the status of their claim. Uh, next we had these, these next bills relate to uh, the tri-agency initiative. We had House Bill 1247 by Representative Lozano, and this bill requires TWC, the Texas Education Agency, and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board to jointly develop a strategic framework to encourage work-based learning in the state and prepare a report on the framework and submit the report to the Texas legislature no later than December 31st of 2022. Next, we had House Bill 3767 by Representative Mercy, Murphy, and this bill codifies the Tri-Agency Workforce Initiative and requires the Chair of TWC, the Commissioner of the Texas Education Agency, and the Commissioner of the Higher, Higher Education Coordinating Board to hold quarterly meetings to discuss the work of the Tri-Agency Initiative. The bill also requires the three agencies to develop a strategic plan for a unified, for a unified workforce data repository, develop state workforce development goals and strategies, and, sub and subject to the availability of federal funding, work with employers to enhance the reporting of employment and earnings data uh, submitted to TWC as part of employers' filings with the commission. The bill also requires that the agencies, or that, that state agencies that receive funding through the Perkins Act or WIOA uh, to outline, outline how their uses of such funding will align with the, strate the strategic plan developed by the three agencies. Uh, next, related to child, we had several bills related to child care. Uh, first, we had House Bill 619 by Representative Sempronia Thompson. This bill requires that TWC prepare a report on the strategic plan, or prepare a strategic plan for improving the quality of the infant, toddler, preschool, and school-age child care workforce in the state. Next, we had House Bill 2607 by Representative Tallarico. And this bill requires that all child care providers participating in TWC's subsidized child care program be TRS certified. The bill also provides TWC with authority to develop a process to allow a child care provider to request a waiver to extend the maximum length of time to no more than 36 months that the provider may participate at the entry level star rating. Next, we had Senate Bill 1555 by Senator Zaffarini, and this bill requires that local workforce development boards establish and implement graduated reimbursement rates for child care providers participating in TWC's subsidized child care program that align the, um, to the, commi the commission's age groupings with the child to caregiver uh, ratios and group sizes adopted by the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. These, rate, these rates uh, shall provide also the highest reimbursement rates to child care providers that provide care to children in the age group with the lowest child to caregiver ratio. And these rates are required to be adopted no later than December 1st, 2023. Next, we had a couple of bills related to the Skills Development Fund and JET and the JET program. We had House Bill 4279 by Representative Dominguez, and this bill authorizes the Wyndham School District to be eligible for grants under the Jobs and Education Protections Program, or JET program. We also had Senate Bill 346 by Senator Paxton, and this bill establishes that open enrollment charter schools are now entities eligible to receive grant funding under the JET program as well. Related to apprenticeship, we had Senate Bill 337 by Senator Powell, and this bill requires TWC, contingent on the appropriation of state funding, 
to develop and administer a program under which TWC may award grants to one or more nonprofit organizations that facilitate the participation in apprenticeship training programs of veterans, active duty military service members uh, who are transitioning to into civilian employment. Uh, next, we had Senate Bill 1524 by Senator Hughes, and this bill requires TWC and the Comptroller, uh, contingent on the appropriation of federal funds specifically for this purpose, to develop a tax refund pilot program for persons who employ at least one person that are in a, in a qualified apprenticeship position for at least seven months. And the tax refund would apply to limited sales, excise, and use taxes paid during the calendar year. Finally, I wanted to highlight a bill related to veterans that was passed, and this was House Bill 33 by Representative Dominguez. And this bill requires an institution of higher education to award credit toward a degree or certificate for military experience, education, and training. This bill also requires TWC to evaluate programs of study offered by career schools and colleges leading to industry-based certifications or other workforce credentials uh, to identify programs or courses of study for which skills obtained through military experience, education, and training uh, frequently align. And TWC must also require that the career schools and colleges provide credit for the military experience, education, and training that align with these courses of study. Uh, that concludes my update on the bill. And I would just like to uh, real quickly take a personal privilege and echo Tom's comments and uh, give my thanks to the GR staff um, they really did the heavy lifting and lion's share of the work um, from what I, we just presented to you. And uh, it really is a privilege to lead what I think is the finest GR staff in state government. And uh, with that, that concludes my remarks. And we're happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions I just have to say thanks for the report, um, Michael and, and Tom. And again, congratulate your team for a job well done. And I agree with you. We probably do have the best GR team in the state and probably in the country as well, Michael. I'm going to take the leap yeah. on saying that. So thank you again for the report. I echo those uh, sentiments. I mean, when we started with session, uh, uh, some things I've never seen before, and we're dealing with the pandemic, and then uh, Ed with the drop the mic moment uh, uh, over there. I mean, with compliments coming from Senator Whitmarsh, some things that we've never seen uh, with the pandemic, and I've shared this with the team when we uh, have an opportunity to s sit back and think about what we've done uh, with the legislative session, uh, the UI team with the pandemic, uh, confirmation for both the chairman and I mixed in with everything else uh, is just tre tremendous and, and it's been done with a smile and not a lot of fights uh, at all. So we appreciate the work that you guys are doing day in and day out. It takes a team and Ed, thanks for your leadership in that regard. You know, I, so much happens in the 150 day period, lots of activity. Uh, you know, s these guys managed to stay on top of all of it. Uh, great team, Bob Bloom, your comments. Yeah, I find in the course of human history that, that this, the way people respond to, to things, a lot of times people's, their name, Mr. Cerna, can become a, a verb. For, for example, <laughs> at TAC, to McCarty something would mean to forget to bring the breakfast tacos for the 7 a.m. <laughs> meeting. Or... To Brit something would mean to maintain the most positive attitude I've ever seen under some of the worst circumstances uh, that you could do. So, so uh, I think that in the case of <laughs> McCartying something, we, that can be forgiven. There was some miscommunication, I think, uh, from some folks. Uh, to Brit something, yeah, I think we'll see that continue. Having said that, uh, Tom, um, your, your, your team uh, has performed very well very, very well, this legislative session. Uh, Michael, um, appreciate all your work. Everyone, uh, if I start listing names, I'll forget the names, so I'll just stop right there. But but uh, you guys, um, it, it's it, the work can be fun if you'll let it, and you guys let it, and, and we, we worked with a lot of offices, and uh, you, don't, you don't get the phone calls I get about your performance, and so uh, what I will do is sum those up for you, which was um, we had unsolicited calls from offices um, praising TWC staff for our ability to make complicated issues easy to understand and provide the legislature the tools they needed to do their job. I, yeah, honestly, I, I, that's success uh, in this arena. Appreciate it. 
Um, no, we got a lot of work to do left federally, and, and there's always uh, work that follows on from a legislative session like this one, but um, can't uh, in any way, in any way, um, s say that we should have done anything better or different because I, I think given the circumstances, I think we did our job to the best of our ability, and I, and I thank you for that. And, and just to conclude my remarks, um, w Tom, let's set a date soon. I'll, I'll, I'll take you and, and buy you a breakfast taco. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. I will not McCarty the taco <laughs> situation. That's correct, Commissioner Daniels. We appreciate your support. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. We have, sir. I have nothing under the executive. No director. executive director report. No, sir. Any other item to come before the commission? I got one thing, but none here, Chairman. A couple of things here. I'm attending War College, uh, uh, courtesy of the, the guys in Temple, and they're pretty phenomenal. We're doing it virtually this year, and uh, I look forward to bringing you guys information on that. Uh, we're going to the TDC for their mid-year conference where we're recognizing uh, workforce and economic development projects uh, that are going on. And then lastly, I have a couple of interns uh, uh, in, the in the audience. So Feliciano Garza uh, is an intern. You can stand up. He's a tall guy there. And, and also Alexandra, uh, I call her Alex Baker. She's at Trinity uh, as, as well. And Feliciano just finished uh, at St. Edwards. And so we are a real strong as relates to interns and in, uh, uh, and we're going to be recognizing interns uh, through something I'm calling Texas Interns Unite later on this year, uh, where we'll be uh, showcasing that. That's the employer, uh, the talent pipeline for our employers, and so we're we're excited about uh, the folks. A, a current here. Trinity Tiger. The, uh, she's a she's a current Trinity Tiger. So that's right. What, what's your major? I can't hear you. You're gonna have to stand up. Business. Sp Spanish and business. Yeah. What year? You're going into your senior year. Do you know any finance majors there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you did you happen to run across someone named Emily Daniel? Oh, yeah, she claimed she went to class, but now I'm <laughs> questioning <laughs> maybe what she was doing. Uh, Ryan, Emily's pretty famous recogni recognition right there. I mean, <laughs> it's not so bad. Commissioner, you're working on your Spanish, huh? Espanol. Hable espanol poquito. Mira por la ventana. What? <laughs> what? What makes you think I know Spanish? <laughs> what makes you think I know it? Chairman, this is going downhill. You better stop this. Uh, does that conclude your comment? You comments. should stop right there. <laughs> uh, in the vein of introductions, Natasha Fisher, somewhere back there. I saw you earlier. There, well, you have to stand up. She's a law student at Emory University. She's joined us this summer as an intern, where she's going to be working on legal things. So we're going to have a legal kind of summer. But she's going to be working on some policy items, uh, too. Um, we'll see. Uh, uh, very, very excited. The law student kind of gives uh, kind of a different viewpoint, but, uh, but I think definitely going to be a great addition to the office. So thank you, Natasha. So uh, for all the, the folks interning in the various offices and throughout the agency, um, I, I just absolutely love having interns around such a, a different viewpoint, helps us see things mm -hmm. through a different lens. And so you guys make the most out of, out of your internship. Internship, let me, let me lecture. Internship is the only time in your life when you can ask all the questions why that you never get to ask once you're on the payroll. So uh, <laughs> ask all your why questions now because people will actually answer it while you're still an intern. So with that, commissioners, any other item come for the commission? None here, Chairman. None here. All right. So do we have a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. Second that motion. It's been moved. Second to adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you.